as well as community organizations that folks can partner with and plug into when engaging with um, HBCU talent when, and, and also furthering um, the fostering of community building in this, in this uh, region. Also, um, this employer forum, I wanna just be very clear, this is for you all. This is for you all. No matter if you're coming to these conversations with a fully formed strategy and plan within your organization, or just beginning to explore um, these conversations and having um, internal internal um, ideation sessions about what, what are the possibilities that recruiting from HBCUs um, presents to your organization. So I want to ensure that we are you know, holding space to where everyone is on this journey and that we um, can offer guidance and direction no matter what stage you're in. Um, additionally, we want to foster connectivity between you all. Um, this region, I think what's, um, what is the top of mind is this region will not remain competitive if we don't approach this as a collective issue to solve for. Um, so understanding how can we share best practices. Um, I understand that can be um, a little sticky when you're sitting in the same meeting rooms as competitors, uh, with your competitors, but also I want to ensure you that no one has this completely figured out yet. Um, and I'm hoping that we can we can do that as a region and collectively approach this together. Um, so it's imperative that we come together, that we have the willingness to engage with one another, um, to, to have some advancement on these efforts. Also, um, Greater MSP does a great job at facilitating this HBCU enterprise team, which is made up of some employers who are on this call today. Um, and after the series, you'll get more in, um, information on how to engage and plug into this group if you're if you would like to um, join us in this effort and in this work. Um, I wanted to give some background as well as like who's on the call today. We're joined by over 138 registrants, um, 33 organizations across the region who've signed up for this uh, this session um, and the series of conversations. And again, this is exciting work. I'm so happy to be here, and um, I would not have uh, been able to uh, have this organized without the help from the employer enterprise team, who you'll hear more about in a minute, um, and also Emily Fitzsimmons, who is the engagement manager for Make It MSP. You'll hear from Emily shortly, um, but now I'd like to um, uh, uh, preview a message from uh, Sydney Bickerstaff, who is, our VP, who is Greater MSP's VP of Operations. So thank you so much, and I'm excited for the next hour and 15 minutes together. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Fitzsimmons, and I am the Engagement Manager with Make It MSP, and I want to thank you all for being with us today. I'm really excited to kick off this series and welcome Cindy Bickerstaff, our Vice President of Operations at Greater MSP, to share a little bit more about her personal um, connections to this work, why it's important to Greater MSP as an organization and partnership, and why it's important to MSP as a region. Sydney, can you introduce yourself to our attendees today? Yes, thank you, Emily. Um, my name is Sydney Bickerstaff, and I'm the Vice President of Operations for Greater MSP. I am actually a transplant to the region. Um, I relocated to Minnesota in 2017 and first started off working with the Men's Final Four and joined Greater MSP in September of 2019. I'm also a proud graduate of two HBCUs for undergraduate Hampton University and for graduate school I attended at Florida A&M University. That's wonderful. Can you talk to us, you know, knowing that you are an HBCU alumni, can you talk to us a little bit more about your personal connection to this work? Yes, um, for me, one thing that's important is, you know, recognizing the talent, recognizing, you know, the awesome individuals that attend HBCUs, that graduate and go on to do mighty things across this country, whether that's in sports, you know, whether that's um, in education, philanthropy, you know, entertainment, et cetera. But, you know, a lot of times that spotlight is not shined on HBCU students. They're kind of thought of as a second tier, but, you know, it's really important that we recognize that talent um, and we, you know, shine that spotlight on them. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. So Sydney, why is recruiting, retaining, and empowering HBCU alumni so important to greater MSP as a region? 
Good question, Emily. HBCU students and alumni represent some of our country's most talented leaders and professionals. It's no question that their skills and experiences would drive innovation across MSP's economy and world leading industries. We know, however, that MSP continues to see a deficit in the net migration of highly educated people of color with a bachelor's degree or higher who move to and stay in this region. We also know that it is not just a matter of attracting talent, the struggle to retain BIPOC professionals and primarily black professionals is a reflection of the very real challenges individuals face in feeling connected, valued, empowered, and even safe in MSP communities and workplaces. This is why in 2019, Greater MSP and the Make It MSP team set out to learn more about the wants, needs, and dreams of HBCU students. The challenges and patterns HBCU career service professionals see in students and alumni when choosing their career path, and the strategies employers are deploying to better recruit and retain HBCU grads. Wow, so you mentioned 2019. So what did it take to get here where we are today with this employer forum series? It took a lot to get where we are today, but it is an accumulation of more than two years of research, discussion and work from a collective of Make It MSP community and employer partners. Wow, so in addition to the partners that have worked on this project, what is our call to action? What is your call to action? Um, as an HBCU alumni, as a member of the Greater MSP executive team, and a member of the Greater MSP region, what's our call to action for the attendees today um, moving into the future? There's two call to actions. First, a call to action to take these learnings back into your organization, recognizing the efforts to recruit, retain, and empower HBCU grads as, long, as a long-term investment and commitment to their success in and outside of the workplace, and two, a call to action to continue to come back to this table as a collective of employers committed to making MSP a place where Black talent and their families can thrive because we are greater together. Awesome. Well, Sydney, thank you so much for being with us today. We're really excited to have you and we're excited to kick off this employer series. Thank you, Emily. Wonderful. Well, hi everyone. This is Emily Fitzsimmons here. Um, really excited that you're all joining us today on this Wednesday morning. So we just had a chance to hear from Sydney Bickerstaff, our VP of Operations, about you know this regional approach to this work and why it was so important to start as a collective. Um, Brittany, if you advance to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about just more about what it took to get here. So this work really started in early 2019 when our enterprise team, which is a group of employer partners that come together around shared um, talent challenges and opportunities. Um, and we were looking at the data of what it was gonna take to continue to grow our workforce, to grow it equitably and to empower the talent um, that exists around the country. So HBCUs emerged as an, a rising opportunity. So in the spring of 2019, Sydney um, and another colleague of Greater MSP, Tiffany Orth, traveled to Washington to meet directly both with students um, as well as career services professionals at HBCUs in the Washington DC area. So those findings really caused us to look internally at our organizations. So a lot of the things that came out of those conversations were really about what it was taking to build authentic connections to the students. You know, learning that it's more than just showing up on campus a few times a year but that um, HBCUs and their students are seeking real connections with employers, both in terms of building trust and better understanding their career pathways and community connections if they are to make the move to a place like Minnesota. So we continue to meet as a group. Um, we also looked inward at our own organizations and um, had some roundtables to talk about what we were doing on campuses um, and in terms of engaging with HBCUs, what was working well, what wasn't working well, what were we hearing from students when we showed up on campus? Um, and from that, we just really wanted to also look at the HBCU landscape. 
So what does it look like in terms of where the students are industry by industry? Where could we as a region more strategically target together if we were to look to attract more of the talent from HBCU, um, uh, HBCU um, institutions across the country? And again, um, this isn't just about attracting talent. This is very much also about retaining talent, helping um, bridge the connections um, that are so critical in making sure that talent not only feels connected to our region, but also that continues to build equitable um, economic opportunity for all here too. So before we jump in really deep into the data, because if you know Greater MSP, uh, we talk a lot of data, but Brittany, if you can advance to the next slide, I know that we have many partners that are familiar with uh, Greater MSP and Make It MSP on the call, but we also have several that are new. So just, in, just a quick level set on, on what Greater MSP is, is we truly are a collective and a partnership of investors, employers, community members, um, public and private sector partners, including local government organizations, all with one regional vision. And that is to make the Greater MSP region a leader um, in the entire world in inclusive economic growth by welcoming all, empowering talent and igniting innovation. So our mission is to do that by accelerating regional competitiveness, inclusive economic growth, um, doing that through job creation, capital investment, and the execution of strategic initiatives. So in, in line with strategic initiatives, Brittany, you can advance to the next slide. Um, that is what Make It MSP is. So Make It MSP started um, about six years ago and was launched as the region's talent attraction and retention initiative. So it's important that we place this kind of in the library of the other initiatives that are going on across the region because um, they're strategically chosen and there are strategic overlaps. So a couple other initiatives that we have um, through um, various networks and collectives across the region. One includes Forge North, which is all about startups and innovation, um, empowering our region's entrepreneurs. We have um, a new initiative, Embold, which launched in October, which is all about the future of food. Um, and we also have Connects MSP, which is about building inclusive talent pipelines for the talent that's here in the region. So I bring that up because um, we know that HBCUs gra have graduates that are some of the innovators in food and egg. We know that many HBCU alumni and grads are actually um, students from our Minneapolis St. Paul region and maybe have participated in college and career readiness programs. We also know that many of the HBCU alumni and students that were looking to um, choose MSP as their home are entrepreneurs um, and will be some of those startup founders. Um, so it's important to kind of keep that breadth of the work of this partnership in mind as we move forward. So if Brittany advances to the next slide, a little bit about the work of Make It MSP and why HBCU engagement in particular was chosen um, as a priority. And it really comes back to the work um, and the intersections of HBCU engagement um, that it offers. So historically, Make It MSP has um, targeted four different areas of work. The first with MSP Hello is welcoming newcomers. The second, MSP Tech, is about attracting uh, tech talent to choose MSP as the region to grow um, their tech careers versus a place like San Francisco, Boston, Seattle, and other tech hubs in the US. And the HBCU engagement work really lies at the intersection of our other two. So MSP Campus, which is all about attracting and retaining, re and retaining recent graduates, and BMSP, which, is, which has been focused work around connecting professionals of color, attracting, retaining, and empowering those that are here as well. So Brittany, you can move to the next slide, and we're going to talk a little bit about not just why this is an opportunity, but why it's an imperative. So we know um, through census data, through work from the state demographer, through our own survey and insight gathering, we know that growing BIPOC communities, they are the drivers of our region and state's workforce. The modest growth that we've seen in our workforce in recent years here in Minnesota is due almost entirely to the expanding um, BIPOC workforce in our region. Also, we know that while MSP ranks about middle of the pack against our, against our peer metros at attracting um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color to our region, we are near the dead bottom in terms of retaining them, particularly those with, with a bachelor's degree or higher. 
you'll see the stat on top here that MSV actually ranks number 28 out of all uh, 35 major metros at, attract, at the net migration of BIPOC with a bachelor's degree or higher. So we're here today talking specifically about HBCUs. So Brittany, if you advance to the next slide here, um, why is this such an, why is this so important? Frankly, um, it's what we've heard from H, from Black Minnesotans um, in our region through our surveys um, through the BMSC network. So in 2019, we um, asked um, our survey respondents from across the region, this is after collecting more than um, 1,700 re responses, um, if they were likely, unlikely, um, considering moving out of the region in the next three to five years. So nearly one third of all BIPOC respondents said yes, they were either likely or extremely likely to leave the region in the next three to five years. And 49% of Black and African American respondents said the same. So 49%, that's nearly half of all surveyed um, Black Minnesotans said that they were likely or extremely likely to leave the region. So we're looking at other regions like Orlando, Atlanta, Austin, Denver, Tampa, and Dallas that are seeing growth, that are attracting um, and retaining more BIPOC professionals. And what's interesting is to tie that to what are we hearing for the reasons why people are coming and going from, from MSP in particular. So the top reason that BIPOC are moving to MSP is for job opportunities. So that's why we're here talking to employers, because you all are those opportunity brokers when it comes to job opportunities for HBCU students and alumni. But the top reason for um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color relocating out of MSP is the lack of diversity and cultural awareness. So that's why a large part of what we're talking about today isn't just about increasing your recruiting techniques, but also about how we're making this place um, more inclusive um, for all. Second, I'll say the second reason for relocating is weather. It's kind of out of our control, but it is important to think about when we're looking at the landscape of where HBCU students are from and even where HBCU students exist, that even things like climate can be a barrier um, in terms of um, both attracting and keeping students and alumni here too. So Brittany, you can advance to the next slide. And um, now that we kind of have a foundation for why this is important, um, I wanna give a huge thank you to our, our teams that have worked on, on um, getting us to here today. So we've had um, a group of um, employer partners from US Bank, Target, United Health Group, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Ecolab, Best Buy, Minnesota Department of Human Services, Sleep Number, 3M, General Mills, and Thrivent as well. Um, and also the UNCF, um, our local chapter, these teams have been meeting um, for the last several months, ideating ways that we can better engage HBCUs, identifying that a forum like this is what's most needed, um, and also leveraging their direct experiences um, and expertise in recruiting at large, but also in recruiting at HBCU um, institutions. So I wanna give a big thank you to everyone that got us to where we are today. And with that, I will kick it back to Halston to get the program started. Awesome. Thank you, Emily, for building that foundation and giving us um, more of an understanding of why we're here, what's happened so far, and how we're collectively going to move forward together. So I'm briefly going to go over, um, very briefly, <laughs> an, uh, an overview of HBCUs and their impact. Um, I know our time together today is very brief, and I want to ensure that we have adequate amount, an adequate amount of time to connect with our very special guest. Um, so um, I'm briefly going to go through the next couple slides, and then we will kick it off um, to one of our employer, uh, enterprise employer team members. But first, um, we can advance to the next slide, please. Um, what are HBCUs? I think we can spend an entire session dedicated to um, really talking about these national treasures, um, these institutions that have been um, um, 
uh, pivotal to our advancement as a nation, um, who have made um, countless contributions to uh, a global society, and that continue to be places where Black and Brown people can thrive. Um, again, proud alumni of an HBCU and advise, like, I'm just so happy to be here to have this conversation. Um, but as of, I wanted to provide very brief um, fun facts. As of 2019, there are 101 HBCUs located across 19 states. Um, and that also includes the District of Columbia, so uh, Washington, D.C., and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, so I, I, I am really happy that Emily brought up um, location, because when seeking to recruit, I think having a location strategy uh, may be um, starting with recruiting efforts uh, from HBCUs located in Ohio, because it's kind of, the, it's similar weather or Washington, D.C., um, similar weather to what they would experience, um, talent would experience um, uh, weather conditions in Minnesota. So being very targeted in your approach is a really good idea and understanding where students are, like have been living for the past four or five years. Also, HBCUs are largely located in the Southeastern United States, again, um, uh, with the most operating in the state of Alabama. My HBCU was in Alabama, so I spent five years there, and it was a very hard transition to come back to Minnesota and um, get ready for that winter. Um, uh, HBCUs are responsible for enrolling 10% of all Black students in, um, in America. Like, thinking about how immensely huge that number is. Um, HBCUs have produced some of the um, nation's top lawyers, um, scientists and engineers and are leading in uh, a lot of the production of black um, black folks in um, STEM related fields. So I know that's immensely important to a lot of our employers who are on the call today. Um, yeah, currently 25% of African American graduates with STEM degrees have come from HBCUs and HBCUs are leading that effort to diversify the STEM field both in education and career pathways. So we are going to be spending most of our time talking about um, 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 employers, but the next session is for employers as well, but also putting that that um, educational um, academic lens on some of this work uh, to ensure that we're holistically approaching it. Next slide, please. Um, my team has created a strategic framework uh, in partnership with uh, Greater MSP, and this um, um, proposed strategy for implementing this, the framework, which you all will have access to, it comes with um, uh, maps, um, um, tips and tricks for how to really um, internally develop a um, an organizational approach as well as a collective approach to um, recruiting from HBCUs, how to get started, what are some common pitfalls, and what should be top of mind when engaging when seeking to engage in authentic, meaningful relationships. So what we uh, talk about in the strategic framework are the following. So leveraging the employer networks um, to access their Black affinity groups. We understand that like um, the internal affinity group, Black affinity groups we have in our, in our um, multiple organizations, a lot of us know each other, and there's a strong connection and commitment there, and most of these, um, these professionals actually do come from HBCU, so it's a great place to plug in and to really leverage those, um, those networks within your organization as a, as, a, as a resource and as a tool to, um, to further engage and foster community building. Also, develop a better understanding of how Minnesota-based um, HBCU alumni can collectively reach back to their, um, their institutions, um, finding organic ways in which we can ensure that um, um, a sustained pipeline is being created or pathway from folks from their specific alma mater back to, you know, eventually to Minnesota. So finding ways to do that. Also assess what framework currently exists to better understand gaps and opportunities. A lot of you all are, are in a space of either doing something or wanting to do something. So finding time, um, um, to connect and understand what some of those best practices are is going to be great in this, as well as understanding what exists in the landscape around us in terms of community, what are community organizations doing to ensure that um, Black talent, when they relocate to the to um, this region, are feeling supported and nurtured and um, and um, uh, connected. Also, embedding a virtual relationship management component into this framework to enable connection uh, um, amongst partner institutions. We can't um, 
you, obviously this pandemic has changed a lot of what engagement looks like. So being ensure, being um, ensuring that we're able to be accessible and can engage with others um, is, is immensely important. And also providing, um, providing more connections for touch points throughout a year that don't just happen at a career, a career, um, a career services event. Um, um, or excuse me, job fair. And then also develop a partnership strategy that engages HBCU talent early in their job search. It is immensely um, uh, difficult for both the, uh, the prospective uh, employee as well as a, um, a, a recruiter or st a st someone from staff recruiting to um, develop these relationships right when a student is graduating and really try and sell Minnesota. So how do we find um, intentional pathways to ensure that we're having multiple touch points throughout a student's career in their, um, in their HBCU matriculation, but ultimately um, constantly um, reaching back and staying in contact and again, building a solid foundation of trust and, um, and care to ensure that the, uh, the state they pick, the employer they pick is based in Minnesota and based in our region. Um, so that's just a little bit, a little overview of the framework. So we can go into the next slide, which we're gonna hear from one of our um, um, uh, employers, uh, uh, em employer, Enterprise, employer enterprise team members. Um, all right. Hi everyone, Emily Fitzsimmons here. I'm the engagement manager with Make It MSP and I'm really excited to be here with a longtime partner of the Make It MSP initiative, Angel from Blue Cross Blue Shield, here to share the employer perspective about why HBCU engagement is so important to uh, the organization and then also um, Blue Cross Blue Shield's important role in our region. So Angel, can you introduce yourself uh, today to the rest of the employers on this kickoff call? Yeah, hi, my name is Angel Udine. I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Blue Cross. And I've had lots of opportunity to do a bunch of initiatives, as Emily has said, with Greater MSP. And this is one that I'm really passionate about. Um, I happen to be a product of an HBCU. And so I'm really engaged with this work in making sure that we have uh, the ability to keep and recruit talent from those HBCUs into the region. Thanks for sharing that, Angel. So can you talk a little bit more now about why HBCU recruitment, uh, retention and engagement of those alumni and graduates has been identified as a priority for Blue Cross Blue Shield as an organization and employer? Sure. You know, like many organizations across the country, BIPOC representation is a key factor and increasing BIPOC representation is important. Um, it really is increasing diversity in organizations. Top performing companies have better performance if they have diverse workforces. And so Blue Cross is not unlike that and looking to exceed and reinvent healthcare. And so because of that, we know that we have to have talent that represents the communities that we serve and the customers that we serve. And therefore, what we want to do is intentionally go to these HBCU organizations and recruit from them because we know there's top talent there. A lot of those individuals that have gone to those HBCUs are people who actually are from our region and want to return and find uh, appropriate employment um, that matches the skill sets and the disciplines that they've gone to study for. And we want to be the organizations that bring them back home or recruit them if they're considering the Twin Cities as a place or a destination for employment. Um, so that's the reason why it's really critical. Now for Blue Cross Blue Shield, us being in healthcare, we have five top HBCUs that we focus on that really have programs in the medical uh, field, in the healthcare field, clinic, clinicians um, and the like. So we wanna make sure that we're being intentional and in going into those organizations and those institutions. Excellent, yeah. Thank you for tying that to the, to the broader industry. And I'm wondering if we can take it up even one more level too. So, you know, part of this work is that we're doing this as a collective. There's multiple employers that have identified this as a priority. So in, in that line of thinking, why is this so important as a regional imperative, right? Why do we, you believe that we're stronger doing this together as a collective MSP region? 
So, you know, my philosophy on a collective um, mindset is that it's one thing to compete amongst each other, but it's even more difficult when we're competing against communities such as uh, Chicago and Houston and Charlotte and, and Arizona and Las Vegas and you name it, other, or, other um, cities and communities across the country. And so the way we are better is by doing our initiatives and our efforts collectively. We don't have to compete against each other anymore. What we need to do is recruit and retain the top talent here in the region. And if individuals happen to go from Best Buy to Target, from Blue Cross Blue Shield to United Health Group, that's fine. At least we keep that talent here to serve our communities and grow our businesses in this region. We don't want to give that top talent up to those other areas. So I think the collective mindset is really more productive. And we've learned that because we've seen how we pull together. And then even if they stay with us, what we find is we share best practices amongst ourselves in these collectives. So we can learn from each other and we can keep those individuals even in our own companies. When you talk about particularly with the BIPOC talent, um, everything is based on relationship and community because they not only come to our region for the job, but they wanna make sure that they have roots and they have connections in the community. And so no one organization has to do that by themselves. We can share that information and those resources and then we can keep that talent and help them understand that we are a community, if you will, of corporations and that we value their presence here. Yeah, that's excellent. And so knowing that part of this series is hopefully helping employers take that first step, right? Both as an individual organization and as a collective. So knowing that this is a call to action, what is your call to action? If you could give one, um, one ask, one critical action that organizations could take, whether that be after our first call or long-term, what would that be for those on the call today? First of all, join us because that's gonna be half of your challenge, your battle in recruiting this top talent. There's no loss there. It's all gain. That's the first thing. But the other call to action is once you join us and you engage with the HBCUs to bring this talent or retain this talent in the area, utilize the collective resources and the community to make sure that your talent stays. Don't try to reinvent the wheel and do it by yourself jump in the game with the rest of us and use the resources that we've cultivated together as a community. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Angel. I'm so appreciative of you joining us and speaking on behalf of the employers that's part of this initiative. Um, we're really grateful for My you. My pleasure. Awesome. Thanks, Angel. Thank you. All right, that was a, a great, um, uh, just great perspective from Angel, who's been a longtime partner in this work um, uh, with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. Um, so it was great to learn about her um, uh, insights and the perspective she shared on why this is important work and how we can collectively come together to, um, to have an impact. So next, we're actually going to hear from um, an HBCU alumna. Her name is Andrea Hubbard. Um, I still call her Andrea Du Bois because she just got married. <laughs> but she is um, a, uh, uh, a graduate. Uh, well, let me start with, she's a native of Hickory, Mississippi, and she now resides in Shoreview, Minnesota. Uh, she joined Lando Lakes in about 2015 and is currently a business intelligence analyst supporting um, product development um, for the team. Uh, prior to Lando Lakes, Andrea worked as a senior data processor for Alcorn State's University Registrar's Office in Lorman, Mississippi. And in 2009, um, she received her Bachelor's of Science and uh, excuse me, Bachelor's of Business and Administration with a concentration in marketing from the University of Arkansas. I re uh, she also received her um, MBA and her MS, uh, her master's in agricultural economics from Alcorn University in 2013 and 2015. So I'm super excited that Andrea could join us today. Uh, she and I met, um, again, a lot of HBCU um, uh, or folks who relocate here meet in these very informal settings. Um, if it's not at work, it's either at um, a church or um, other other con uh, other places for connection um, uh, that, that really cater to uh, the Black experience and this community. So she and I met at some informal um, 
party in 2015 and have been connected ever since. And I really feel that um, our connection is what is keeping us grounded in this space, in Minnesota, in this region. So um, I'm super happy that she can join us. So we can we can share screen with uh, um, Andrea. It will not allow me to start my video. I think the host may have to do so. Thank you, Andrea. So we'll work on that. So we're going to work on getting you, um, getting you uh, uh, um, access to share your, um, your video. And again, y'all, I really appreciate grace and understanding as we try to work through uh, technology, especially working from home. We've been doing this for a year. So a little, or a little over a year now. So um, this is to be expected whenever hosting any type of virtual engagement or meeting. So um, I really appreciate the, the, the grace and the understanding as we um, navigate this. So I'm going to um, remove the spotlight from myself and try and get Andrea on. So one moment. Can you all see me? Yes, we can see you. Perfect. All right, Andrea. So I'm gonna remove my spotlight and get you up here. I am actually, I'm happy to be here with you guys today. Thanks for having me, Halston. Of course, of course. So um, I have you spotlighted. So I'm going to just start with um, some questions for you and uh, and just be as uh, share as much as you'd like to share. Again, I think it's really important that we can share um, um, authentic um, uh, answers to some questions that employers are really uh, curious about when it comes to um, getting this right and, um, and ensuring that they're operating in ways that are um, engaging and respectful and authentic. So first, I'd like to just learn about, um, or we'd like to learn about um, how you first got connected with Lando Lakes, like what made them the organization uh, to say yes to in a, in a very competitive market, and also why, why was Minnesota, did you consider Minnesota um, uh, uh, what, what, what did you think about in terms of like coming, relocating to Minnesota all the way from Mississippi? So if you could just start there, we'd love to hear that. Absolutely. So first thought uh, was me, Black girl, locating to Minnesota. Are there Black people there? I, just full transparency. Um, I wondered if there were Black people here in Minnesota. Um, but I first connected with Lando Lake. Um, it was a couple of months before my graduation in May of 2015. And I decided to attend a Manners Conference. And for those of you that don't know, Manners is an organization for minorities in agriculture, natural resources, and related sciences. And um, as I attended the Lando Lakes booth, I connected with a recruiter named Matt Souder. Um, and I heard you ask, what was it that made me say yes to this organization? Typically with recruiters, they're looking at you on paper, right? And that's what appeals to them. But the difference with this recruiter is that he was more interested in me and getting to know me personally. Um, while it was kind of an on-the-spot job interview, he was curious about my experience in Mississippi, my background, the things that I did. I think we actually had a conversation about our families and my basketball background before ever like diving into my professional background. And that is what made them the organization that I said yes to. When he told me that I would likely have to relocate uh, to Minnesota, of course, um, I started doing my research. Um, but in the end, I said yes, and here I am almost six years later. Awesome. Thank you for, for that. And I really, I really like that you um, discussed how it, it felt like a more, like a personal connection. It didn't feel like, um, like you were a number, but actual, like actually seen. So I love hearing that and that and a, a, a relationship was established. So I'm also curious to learn more about your relocation experience. Um, you you kind of highlighted that, but like, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the transition from Mississippi to Minnesota? Absolutely. So the Relocation in itself, it was seamless, right? Um, as companies are recruiting um, you, they provide different services. And so the process was seamless as far as the company, like sending someone to pack my items and move them. Um, I think the missed opportunity 
with a lot of companies is that when you're relocating, they tend to focus on individuals looking to buy a home. And that mm. at that time I wasn't. Um, so there weren't any real resources provided to me um, to search for an apartment and to come and visit and really see the area. I kind of had to do that on my own um, online or fly here on my own and drive around to see, you know, what neighborhoods were safe because being a black woman coming to a mm -hmm. place where I didn't know if there were a lot of black people or people that looked like me, I wanted to make sure I was in a safe space. Also being from Mississippi, we don't get a lot of snow um, and the weather has definitely been a challenge. <laughs> so there were definitely things that had to check the box, right? Like I wanted to live within a certain um, distance from the workplace. I wanted to find a place with underground heated parking. Um, so there were definitely some things that had to check the box for me, um, but the missed opportunity was the company providing additional resources other than home buying resources. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for that. I think that's really important. And I would have never even thought that was a challenge. So uh, great, great um, insights that you shared. Um, I'm also curious as to, um, um, let's get real, like what have been some challenges? <laughs> like, what have been some challenges um, to relocating to uh, Minnesota? Not relocating, but like being a Black woman, HBCU graduate in this region. Okay, I am going to be fully transparent. Um, so... I'll say this is twofold for me. My initial challenge was finding my community, right? And I think Angel spoke about community. Um, so church, Southern Baptist black girl, right? So moving here, I'm like, I have to find a church home. Um, and I did find Shiloh Baptist Church in St. Paul. Um, that informal circle of HBCU graduates, that was important to me too. Um, and of course, that's how I met Halston. We did meet at a party and I think it was a CC Ben event, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. It was a professional event, um, but those informal circles were truly important. Um, and connecting with like-minded women was also important to me. And that's how I found my uh, sorority sisters here. So I am a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. So that was truly important um, to me as well. Um, so the sense of community was one thing, but two, another challenge to me is um, we're being real. There are always explicit and implicit biases in companies hiring practices, right? So being a black woman relocating here, working in corporate America, um, for me, I have to take a step back and, and really see how that would turn out for me from a career path standpoint, right? Like what is my promotion process, progress going to look like over time? And that, that was kind of important to me. So that's a piece. Um, there was one other thing that I wanted to touch on. It'll come back to me um, here soon. Oh, being an HBCU graduate. So since I'm being fully transparent, I do wanna highlight this. While I am highly educated, I have an MBA and I have a master's of agricultural economics, but from an HBCU. And I do think that when companies or recruiters are looking at individuals from HBCUs with these degrees, they're going to look at me differently than they would an MBA graduate from the University of Minnesota, right? Or an agri uh, a graduate with an agriculture degree from an Iowa or Purdue. So that has also been a challenge for me coming to this state and working um, in the, the industry that I work in. Oh, thank you for the transparency. And I think that that requires a lot of um, organizations and companies doing their internal work on understanding um, the value of our educations and, and, and not uh, comparing it to a PWI, a predominantly white institution, but ultimately we have some of the most rigorous <laughs> courses and, and educational background in this country. So not only are we competitive, but we 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 are still we are some of the the, the brightest and best in our in our sectors and in our industries. So I think that that internal um, framing and um, um, mindset shift is something that organizations need to um, need to really do some work in. And I and I'm really happy you highlighted that. That's something that doesn't get talked about a lot. I'm happy you brought it up so I didn't have to <laughs> but that I, I can too as a as a, a graduate of HBCU um had similar experience of having to um um justify that I'm just as bright as as the next person so yeah thank you for speaking truth to that 
Um, so uh, very curious, you've been here for about six years now. So do you advise other HBCU grads to consider working in, Minis in Minnesota-based companies? Like, I just, I want to be, I, I want to ask. Yes, I am going to keep this short and sweet. I'll say absolutely, right? Because the opportunities here are endless. And working for a Minnesota-based company, with COVID now, things have changed, right? So you're able to work remotely. Um, I will say not having to relocate would definitely be an incentive and benefit for individuals, especially from HBCUs, being that um, most of them are located in the southeastern region of the U.S., right? So um, short answer, absolutely. Opportunities here are endless if you're relocating here. But with COVID and, and things, how they've changed, um, even more so, because I do believe that companies now are going to start allowing for more flexibility in where we work. Yeah, absolutely. That's Im immensely important. Like, how do we, what is, what does our new normal look like? And, and that's, that's exactly this, like ensuring that um, being able to work for one of these companies uh, presents flexibility and accessibility for folks. Um, and maybe, and, and also um, including, you know, relocation doesn't have to happen right in the first couple months or a year of work, but ultimately leading to that so we can have that sustained uh, community in this in this region. So um, Andrea, my last, my last question for you um, is what is some advice or perspectives you can share with our employers on how to attract um, talent of color or talent from HBCUs to their respective organizations? And this can be very brief, this can be detailed, whatever you feel comfortable sharing, like what are you already gave us some nuggets on, on relocation, but um, if there's any other insights you'd like to share, please do so. Um, I am going to keep this brief. Um, I'll say I don't think there is an issue of attracting talent, right? I don't think there's an issue of attracting the talent and getting the talent here because the data has shown that people do relocate here to Minnesota for the job opportunities. Um, what I will say is the issue is with retaining that talent and, and it showed in the data as well. Um, in my words, it doesn't lie in the nine to five, it lies in the five to nine. Like what are some of those things that happen after, as a black woman, after I get off of work? If I am an introvert and I haven't found my community or my church home or those informal circles of people that look like me, that five to nine is going to be critically important in my decision to leave Minnesota or to stay. So my advice would be for companies to maybe dive a little deeper in what some of those things are in the community that people like me can get involved in. Because when I look around Minnesota and the area that I am in, being here six years, there are still not a lot of spaces for me, right? Um, or for people specifically that look like me. Um, while the Black businesses and all those things have grown over time, um, I would just challenge companies to, to look at that five to nine and reflect on what it is that they're doing to ensure that their employees, um, their BIPOC employees, feel included in their communities after hours. Andrea, thank you for sharing that that wisdom with us. And I, I too would um, that's something that's come up in conversations too. Like, what are we doing to to further and foster uh, community building um, within the within our respective Black community, especially for folks who are um, relocating to this region? And then how can employers and these companies plug into that, you know, and how can they, how can you truly support it? And, and that looks like a variety of ways. I know this is converse, these are conversations that Greater MSP is currently having. And um, we would, we would love to, to continue to hear more about that. So I think that's a conversation for another time, but I just wanted to um, deeply express my gratitude to having you here to, uh, to share your insights, share your wisdom, share your experience with us. We are better for it. And um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yes, of course. You can, you can log off, Andrea, unless you want <laughs> All right. So um, I'm really grateful that we were, had the time to speak with um, 
with Andrea and she was able to, you know, share her, share her wisdom with us. Um, now we have about a half hour left. So we're going to jump right into another speaker. So we have Dinah Wimbush with us from Tuskegee University, and she is a career services professional. Um, and she's just going to, um, uh, Brittany, I have you um, unpin Andrea and then um, pin Dinah so we can have her spotlighted. Um, but ultimately, I, uh, we, we felt like it was, um, it was immensely important to ensure that we have not only a voice from the um, the HBCU relocating community, but ultimately a career service professional who we need to challenge our, uh, we need to um, really commit to um, understanding uh, how to best engage with um, with these institutions and no better than to have someone who's directly in proximity to this work. So um, I will, um, ask Brittany to uh, uh, pin Dinah so we can get her started. And, and I look forward to uh, uh, an more, even um, uh, more engaging uh, uh, conversation. So um, can, we, can we get that started? Hi. Hi, Dinah, how are you? I'm well, how are you? Good, thank you so much for joining us today. So um, I briefly gave a little bit of background on, um, uh, on you working as a career services professional and ensuring that um, uh, Black students from HBCUs not only are um, nurtured in their experience, but also like uh, how do we get from next step from like engagement and um, uh, in relationship building to actual job offers and employment? So there's a couple of questions I wanted to ask you uh, that if you can share some perspectives with our employers who are on the line today. So um, we're just going to get started uh, with the first question: okay. Are what are what are some top what are the top priorities for HBCU career service departments currently? If you could share that. Okay, with thank us. you. Yep. Great. Thank you so much for having me once again. And I think some of our top priorities remain um, just primarily with, you know, having HBCUs being connected with um, other departments and other companies. So our students really want to be able to thrive once they come to these companies. And um, Career Services really wants to be able to have great relationships with different companies. And we want these relationships to you know, remain steady at all times. And sometimes it's been very hard, especially when you have um, people that are coming in and out of position. So it's hard to remain, keep a steady relationship with certain companies because they're constantly switching out people with these positions. And we definitely want those relationships to remain steady because our students are constantly looking for that type of um, just that type of commitment from the companies. And as you know, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic going on, um, awareness and safety have been extremely heightened. And with the summer of civil unrest, we've had some issues, of course, with justice and corporations who are being silent or um, now rushing, you know, to the doors to seek more HBCU students. Uh, this is great. And it's, you know, results, resulted in a lot of phone calls from different companies to our university. So we are extremely happy about that. And our universities have been here for over a hundred years to, um, you know, just feed into corporate America with our students. And they are extremely happy about that. Um, we're extremely excited about the new opportunities that are ahead for the students. And we're just hoping that these, um, these new opportunities are here to stay and they're not just simply temporary or just, you know, um, transactional for the companies and they don't have anything to gain for the students. No, I think that's really great insight. Like, how are we ensuring that we're we were coming to you um, authentic and intentional about how we're going to engage, and that these aren't one-offs to fix to in response to um, the calls for um, for justice and equity, but how are we really building something that that is sustainable and um, and that can be dynamic and evolve. So I think it's really important that you you noted that. And um, I also really appreciate you bringing up um, the pandemic. And it's it's touchy for a lot of people. But um, I really I really want to know um, more about. Uh, so you mentioned the pandemic has resulted in an influx of activation from these corporations and organizations um, who are seeking to recruit 
students from HBCUs. So what has this increase, what does this increase in activation energy looked like and felt like for um, HBCU career services at this time? Like has, what, how has it shifted and changed? Right. Thank you so much for that question. That's really a great question. I'm happy that you asked me. Um, again, this is a really exciting time for us as a university and our students, and we are extremely grateful for the awareness that um, has been brought to HBCUs during this time. Um, we have been bombarded with a lot of emails and calls about um, our students and different things that they're able to provide to companies. Um, at this time, you know, the urgency for different corporations and organizations seeking to partner with us are great in this understanding. Um, we just hope that during this time um, that we've been hardest hit with um, funding, as you know, because we weren't always able to meet, especially at the beginning of the semester. Mostly everything was online, so that resulted in some shifting in funding. Uh, what was really disappointing at the height of the COVID-19 um, pandemic um, most of our students were part, promised internships that, you know, they weren't able to fulfill, especially last summer. And it was sort of last minute that these job offers were snatched away from them. So it's pretty hard to bounce back from that when you're thinking that you're going to get an internship for that summer. And then come May when they think that, you know, just when they may be able to reach out to you again and they're telling you, hey, we don't have any opportunities for you this summer. Um, our students were sort of left with that that, you know, that empty void to feel. Um, lately, we haven't having more funding, which is great as the pandemic is, you know, things starting to get a little better, more people are being vaccinated. Um, our career services and our students really hope for, you know, better opportunities this time around, especially this summer. Um, this makes us feel that um, the commitment with the organizations and the different companies are becoming stronger and better. Awesome. Thank you, Dinah. And I think, can, can we hear, can we hear a little bit more about like internally what's happening with staff, staffing turnovers in terms of the, the, the activation and just the, the engagement or the ask of you all right now from like every company who's seeking to build some type of HBCU strategy? Like, how has that been for, for staffing, especially in, in times of COVID? I know you, you had, um, preface that like budgets have been cut, has that resulted in any cuts to your staff at all? Oh, absolutely. Especially um, within our staff, we have been extremely cut down. Our budgets have been cut. We don't even have a director at this point. They are still um, holding off on that position. So we are really hoping for things, you know, to get better soon. So our budgets are able to be where they should be. And we're able to, um, you know, fill our staff as we should have it. Because as you know, once your staffing is under, then you are, ex you know, you're there to pick up the extra work. So, you know, at this point, we really want it to be, you know, best for our employees and that way it's best for our students so that we're able to help each and every student that comes through our doors, um, you know, receive that um, great employment that they're looking for because at the end of the day, it's all about the students and we don't want the students to be lacking in that situation and nor do we want to be overwhelmed so that we're not able to fully help them in the ways that we should be able to help them. Yes, thank you. So what I'm hearing is like <laughs> the, the folks who are seeking to engage should, should extend some grace and, and patience in terms of like allowing um, your, your departments to re like to rebound after such a tumultuous year of shifts and right. change. Uh, yeah, absolutely. No, I, I really appreciate you bringing that up and highlighting that that has been, that has looked different for a lot of people, but especially to our communities and to our, our institutions. It definitely has. So thank you for, for speaking to that. Um, I have another question as to, um, okay. What are students seeking in employers? So what are some trends you're noticing? Um, what have students said or um, what have they indicated as like something that would make a, uh, a region like Minneapolis or um, uh, our, our employers based here um, attractive? Oh, absolutely. Um, our students really see themselves in roles that are making a difference and an impact in the community and the country. You know, we often see students get placed in these entry-level roles at these companies, and they don't really have a plan to develop them um, into further roles. So the students sort of feel as if once they get there, then they're trying to look for a different role with a different company that's more fulfilling to them. So they really see themselves in being involved once they get to these communities. 
Um, most of them are going to be moving across the country, as we know. So it's going to be, you know, maybe a culture shock for them to see how these different communities thrive that they're not used to seeing. Um, also, many of these organizations lack the capacity to safely nurture and respect um, the care for our, you know, Black students or, you know, students of any color and uh, their culture and talent. Um, so my advice for these companies are to invest in internal diversity and inclusion efforts you know, just to ensure that our the workplace is safe for our students once they become, you know, employees um, with their companies. You know, if your representation at the top doesn't look like the students, then they sort of feel like there may not be a place for them. They're long-term with the company, and most students want to actually get with the company and stay long-term. So that's something that they're definitely looking for. And, you know, we understand this works in the numbers game as well. Um, these are students who have worked extremely hard, you know, when they have been stacked against them. So when it's time for them to graduate and to be employed, they really want to go to an organization or a company that's able to foster their development and growth and with this organization or company because they're looking for stability um, long term. No, I really like that you highlighted that this is something that needs to not only um, students can't just, uh, these companies can't just go seeking to, to um, increase their diversity numbers through, um, through recruiting uh, Black talent. But ultimately, this is something that needs to happen at the top too. If folks don't see themselves or if, these, if this talent doesn't see themselves at the top of your leadership, do you really expect them to stay there and think that they will be the one that, that ultimately climbs to that role? It's immensely lonely and tiring. And um, it's something that I, I, I really am happy that you highlighted because I don't think a lot of folks who are entering these conversations um, have fully like spent enough time noodling on like what does that mean to truly um, infuse the entire organization organizational um, um, organization wide um, 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 effort to diversify. It doesn't just start with entry level, but like throughout the organization. So again, a, a great nugget of wisdom. So I really appreciate that. And I think the last question that I'll I'll just end us with with your time today is going to be. Um, uh, something that we have talked about a lot and that we will continue talking about in the next two sessions that we're hosting um, for this, this conversation series, but like truly getting at the root to um, building trust and connectivity and community with employers um, in this region and HBCU um, career service departments and staff. So what does authentic relationship building look like for um for a career services professional at an HBCU and their students, if you could, you know, share your your wisdom with us in that aspect. Right. Thank you so much for this question. I'm so glad that you asked this. You know, since we develop a lot of close relationships and connections, I think, as I mentioned earlier, um, but sometimes the companies or organizations just seem to go away. And um, a lot of times the person that they assign to work with career services and managing that relationship and, you know, fostering that, that great relationship with us so that we can get the students to them, they either leave or they're no longer a part of it. So this is really difficult for our teams because it feels like um, we're constantly starting over with different companies. And even when you, you know, if you're constantly starting over, it's hard to measure a successful relationship, especially and develop that relationship. Um, Many of these companies are spread out, of course, you know, across the country. And once our students leave their safety net of their HBCUs, it's extremely difficult for some students to transition into that workplace. Um, so they don't really have a person they can go to in that workplace because that role is constantly being turned over um, to offer, you know, more regional approach to attracting and retaining our students at HBCUs. Um, a lot of times we need them to, you know, indicate a level of, you know, it's going to be safe and security, you know, around them so that they feel okay and they're able to, you know, just be the best worker and the best, you know, person for that position that they can be because they're secure in their position and they know everything is going to be okay within that company. You know, um, sometimes you just want to pick up the phone and call the organization and have someone who was aware of our previous company conversations, you know, to be able to talk to and let them know what's going on. But a lot of times that's not available because, like I said, the person's constantly, you know, being replaced with someone else. You know, our students deserve an intentional engagement effort at all times um, on both ends. And so does our recruiting staff here in the office. Um, 
you know, a lot of times these hours are needed to dedicate just a relationship with the within each other so that we can dedicate the relationship with the students and it's fostering relationships, um, you know, within the building and within themselves, you know, in result, that's really what we are seeking for the students. And we think that's that would be best to have these intentional and these long term, um, you know, I just really want to stress the longevity of relationships with these companies because that's what the students are going to look for. No, I really appreciate um, the honesty in that and that transparency in that aspect. Like these are not um, engagements that can happen. Oh, we're going to create a strategy in six months and push it out. Um, it's definitely about long term investments and planning. And that takes time. It takes relationship building. It takes an investment of resources on both ends. And I'm, I'm just really happy that you were able to highlight um, and give us something, you know, us and our, uh, the employers on this call, um, more to think about when it comes to what, um, what it truly means to, to, to look at this as a, as a um, uh, look at this holistically. Because I, I, if, if you would have asked me, I would have had no idea that, um, that um, there was so much turnover in 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 recruiting in, in recruitment teams at these various companies, and then also the fact that like having to restart a conversation over and over because of that attrition uh, from those those roles is something that um, I can only imagine how immensely difficult that is to continue or to establish some type of of results or impact that 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 leads to something and leads to something more than just a couple students coming up here and in in no type of like true relationship building as the foundation. So uh, thank you for sharing that with us, Diana. It's it's all it's so lovely to see you. Um, <laughs> and um, Tuskegee is my alma mater, so I will be there for homecoming since we all had to miss this year. Um, but I, I wanted to ask if there's any questions. Uh, if y'all can put them in the chat. I think we have time for maybe two. Um, I don't see any right now, but I do see that Emily placed in a call to action, and that is to provide a pathway for HBCU alumni to advance in their career, not just seek a first job, um, um, not just seeking a first job, and, but seeking stability and purpose. I think, Dinah, you did call that out as like a lot of these um, students are uh, being put into entry level roles and there's no internal from the organization who's hiring them, no internal plan for progressing them into, into that career, or into that company. So what we see, if I know you weren't on the call earlier, but the data um, indicated that 49%, so almost half of our black talent are um, are leaving this region, and I I I would love to um, since I don't see any questions, I have one more question if that's okay, and feel free okay. to answer as much as you feel comfortable answering and or or okay. not. But um, what 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 advice would you give employers um, um, in terms of like how they can best meet the the um, meet the, uh, the, the need to do that? Um, what, what advice can you give? Is there some type of um, um, uh, career development course that, or, or course or, or playbook that they can create and then bring that to HBCU career services staff? Like here's, your, here's what we're seeking as a five-year plan for you and go over that with maybe someone from your de department and the student to ensure that um, there's, a, uh, there's a connection and there's a plan for the student once they relocate here. Because uh, again, I think um, companies also need to, and companies and employees also need to realize the investment and time of resources they spend in these students and to have that talent leave this location. You've invested time and money and now you've lost it because you haven't paid enough attention to that retainment piece. Um, so if you can give us a little bit of um, provide some color around what what do you think would be some good strategies for employers to implement when seeking to um, to uh, progress uh, black talent and HBCU talent in their organizations? Right, that's a great question. Um, honestly, one thing that I think would be um, great for employers to do, I think when they come in, you know, come in like like you said, come in with a plan to say, hey, you know, we just don't want you to come in and get this entry level position and then move on. We actually want you to stay here with the company and where you're willing to, you know, foster development and growth within your different positions and within this company because we want to see you grow 
and be the best that you can be at these positions, but within our company. Um, so within this company, we have multiple positions and these are just, this is just the position that we're trying to get you in, in the door, but we also want you to stay. And I think once the employer starts stating that more than these students are saying, you know, hey, this isn't just a job, you know, this is my career and this is the company that I want to stay with. And this is the company that wants me here. Because once you feel wanted, you, it, it's, it's, it's nothing else like that. It's, you can't pay for it. You can't, you can't do anything. It's, it's honestly priceless. It's one of those things that are priceless because you can say, hey, at the end of the day, I've had other people reach out for, you know, reach out to me and they may be better paying jobs, but they're not going to treat me the same as this company is treating me and they have invested in me and they honestly care. So I think the companies, you know, I think they should have a five-year plan. And, you know, when you're recruiting students, show them like, hey, you know, we're not just recruiting you for this position. We have a plan for you. And this is what the plan looks like. So if someone can come up and just, you know, if you have other companies that aren't just going to care, so they can say, well, hey, this company made themselves, you know, set themselves aside and made themselves look like a better company for me because, they have a plan for me. Is this just isn't a job? This just isn't an entry level position, you know, to get my foot in the door and then run off to some, another company. This is a company that wants me to be there, and you know, it's intentional. So I I really think that that would be great for companies to think about doing when they're recruiting students. Thank you so much, Dinah. I, yeah, and I see what Andrea um, wrote there. This is a great call out. I was over here providing snaps of approval because I too would love to feel wanted and a part of that company's DNA moving forward, not just right. a transactional um, here, I'm, I'm meeting your diversity number or your quota, but ultimately right. you have a plan for me. You have an invest, you are investing in me. So therefore I'm going to invest in you. And I think having that symbiotic relationship, but ultimately on the onus of the employer is, uh, is a really great way in which we can tackle this issue of like retaining, not only recruiting, but retaining that talent so so that they um, uh, can have a regional impact um, up here as well, not just uh, an organizational impact. Thank you. Thank you. I You're just welcome. really appreciate Thank the you. wisdom and the knowledge you shared with us today. Um, and uh, uh, I can let you, you we're, we're done with our engagement. I don't see any questions in the um, the comment box or the chat, the chat box, but um, I will provide your contact information after the forum. So if folks have questions on how they can engage and reach out um, or would like to, to speak further, I hope that's okay. Um, yeah. So I will, I will provide that, but um uh, it was my my great pleasure to have you featured on this call. And again, I can't thank you enough for uh, sharing sharing your wisdom and your wise words with us, and ultimately getting us ready and prepared for what the next two conversations are gonna gonna look and feel like. So thank, thank you so, you so much, much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Of course, of course. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So Brittany can pull up our next slide. Yo, y'all, we're making great time. <laughs> And usually I get really worried about this, but no, we, we're making great time. And I'm really hoping that you all are um, uh, engaged and excited about, uh, about what's to come. So the next conversation we have is going to be um, uh, focused on um, continuing the conversation. How do we get started? So next Wednesday, May 19th, um, at the same time, so 9.30 and uh, between 9.30 and 11, um, we are going to um, be uh, spending some time and really taking a deep dive and learning about the data. So we went over a little bit of, of data today, but like taking a more in-depth um, approach to that, um, understanding um, uh, data, uh, being equipped with tools and also local resources and networks that can help you all um, uh, support the development of an effective um, HBCU strategy and re um, recruitment and retainment strategy. So if you haven't registered for that, um, it is, um, I think you had the ability to register for all of these sessions or just, um, or the singular ones. Make sure if you are, don't have this on your calendar for next week that you put it on there so that we can ensure that you are, um, you are, uh, able to um, participate, join the conversation, get these tools that can really help you um, further develop um, and understand what a plan, a thoughtful plan will look and feel like. And also be okay that, um, again, a lot of this work is novel and, um, and um, we, we'll collectively figure out how to navigate it. Um, 
the webinar links, the calendar. Yes, uh, and it will hit your inbox tomorrow. Thank you so much for, for that, Emily. Um, we are gonna hear from um, some local folks who are um, um, uh, engaged in these conversations currently from um, either in attraction and retainment um, or connection to uh, HBCUs and also um, hearing from um, uh, academics or folks who are working in academic institutions who have some connections. So Jonathan Harper is a, um, a uh, 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 has uh, attended an HBCU and also works as the diversity, equity, and inclusion director for South Central College and has um, uh, some really great insights about how to um, attract uh, uh, talent of color and um, students from HBCUs to this region. So he will share his insights. We are, pro we are um, um, in the process of confirming one more speaker in the academic space as well to, to support this conversation, as well as hearing from Courtney Gray from HBCU first. So um, uh, this is just a screenshot from um, his website, but he is, he, he, um, is going to uh, kind of keynote us and speak to us about the importance of, um, of meeting students where they are and what that means and how we can um, further engage. So Brittany, I'll have you pull the, the presentation down so I can give everyone a, a nice send off and you can pin me as the spotlight. All right. So, um, so yeah, everyone, thank you so much. And um, if there are any questions uh, about the next conversations or um, you have questions about um, some of the content we covered today, please feel free to reach out um, to myself or Emily um, and we can connect you with some of our great speakers. But I really hope that this time was spent engaging and being curious and, um, and um, really committing to, to showing up fully in this space with all the things that we have. I know that um, we are we will be able to have an impact in this space, um, but ultimately we have to show up to do so. Um, so yeah, I'll give you all uh, two minutes back to your day and I really appreciate the time. I look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. Central Time. And um, yes, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day.